Martin Vetterli, hochdekorierter Wissenschaftler, der an einigen renommiertesten Universitäten gelehrt und geforscht hat. Äh, ETH Zürich, Stanford, Berkeley und seit Anfangsjahr ist er der Präsident der IPFL. Ähm, er hat, äh, unterrichtet dort seit 1995 ähm, und in dieser Zeit hat er unter anderem sich auch mit Massive Open Online Kurse äh, beschäftigt, mit, mit sogenannten MOOCs. Ähm, und es gibt also wohl keinen besseren, qualifizierteren äh, Wissenschaftler, um sich mit der Frage zu beschäftigen, welche sind die drei wichtigsten Aufgaben der Hochschule und welche Verbindungen haben diese Aufgaben zu Open Data. Bitte schön. in German, but I'm going to choose English. How about that? Sorry. Uh, it's late in the day, and so my German starts to be a little bit rusty, so I'll, I'll stick to English. Is that okay? Is that the problem? Who does not understand English raises their hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, as was said, um, we are very interested in open access in open data, in open science at EPFL. It's not a recent addition to our interests. Um, I was formerly at the Swiss National Science Foundation, and open access was a very big theme in research in Switzerland and worldwide. And we were very engaged in trying to reform the publication business. You may or may not have heard about it. <coughs> Uh, it's a tricky business, and then we went into the open data business, and those of you who live from the National Science Foundation probably know that starting in the fall of 2017, very soon, if you write a grant proposal to the Swiss National Science Foundation, you have to submit a data management plan. Okay, so these, of course, to you, you are going to say these are small steps, but if you know Bern, these are huge steps in Bern, okay? <laughs> So, so you have to change the regulation and persuade a million people and so on. Anyway, so let me talk a little bit about open science here. And you have heard the whole day from specialists, so I cannot add very much, I'm afraid. Especially because I wasn't here. So it's sort of difficult, you know, to say what has, you know, what has not been said. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure what has been said. But um, here is an illustration we made uh, about open science. So, and the quote which I like, open science is at a stage where no one is quite sure what it is, but they think it's a good idea. And then if you talk about, you know, about open science to researchers, you know, they will see all these variations, right? If you talk to Google, they say, oh, open science, don't worry, we will host all your data, we'll do the data mining and we'll sell it back to you. I mean, not in as much as cash, but in some form, you will pay for it. Sorry, I'm, I'm a great fan of Google, so that's not a problem, but uh, I also know their business model. And if you talk to other people, they say there is no problem, the data is somewhere, we'll find it, etc. So everybody has you know, a different notion of open science, and so I'm going to tell a little bit about uh, how I look at it. So how did I fall into this movement? Uh, it's relatively simple. I'm in a field which is sort of computational sciences, where open science in principle is simple because you don't have to measure, you know, to find the Higgs boson, right? You sort of make up the experiment yourself. And so it shouldn't be too much of a challenge to actually be an open data scientist. Yet, this was not so easy. Uh, and the history here is there are two characters. One is John Clairbaugh, who was a geophysicist at Stanford and was actually, as far as I can see, the first one in computational science that really said, Okay, something's wrong in the house. He said this in the 90s, because when a PhD student finishes, there is a pile of data and a pile of code, and nobody knows what to do with it. So we start from scratch. Okay, so the next PhD student takes a pile of data, writes new code, and starts new experiment. And uh, another fellow, actually, who is a good friend, uh, Dave Donohoe, is also a, a statistician at 
at Stanford got very involved in actually proselytizing open science among computational scientists, so engineers, uh, mathematicians, applied mathematicians, and so on. And, uh, and that movement, which is from you know, quite a while ago, from the 90s, and, and uh, you know, had, had a lot of influence in the way we were conducting our uh, particular uh, way of doing research. Now, why would this be good for EPFL, right? So I changed my hat from the National Science Foundation to EPFL. And, uh, you know, most things, if you don't have the right incentives, the best ideas will go nowhere, okay? I'm sorry to be so pragmatic. And so if I told to my PhD students or to my colleagues, professors, or to the administration at EPFL, or for that matter, in the science business in Switzerland, I need to have good arguments. And the good arguments uh, are actually listed here. Okay. So if the taxpayer paid for research, the taxpayer wants to see an impact, right? Um, so if you publish open data, if you put your code online, etc., you're going to have much more impact with the research. Maybe not immediately, but to me, this is going to be the effect and the incentive for researchers to go into open science. Now, the quality of the science is going to be better because there is a better scrutiny. As you know, the you know, dark little secret of science is that in certain areas, it's very hard to reproduce results because actually the results are not there. Okay? They are published, but they are not there. And uh, if you're in, a, in, in the open science mode, this will be uh, the exception rather than the rule. And of course, you can reuse the research, for example, a next grad student shows up, he, uh, he or she can continue where the previous PhD student actually stopped. And last but not least, and that's why we are scientists, the so public access should be the normal mode for research results, also that the rest of the world, not just people in Switzerland, a rich country that has a chance to have a well-functioning research system, that the rest of the world can also profit from open science. Good. Why is it happening now? It's digitalization. I, I have a summary here. So the analog world became the digital world, and now everything is possible. Okay, it's not so simple, uh, but you know that this is the big transformation. And uh, the other one is that you know all the knowledge of humanity moved from libraries. That's how I grew up, and you know it was fun to try to find information, but it was very time-consuming. Uh, to an electronic version, where it's, it's essentially the knowledge of humankind at some point will be in a real large-scale Wikipedia and uh, will be indexed and searchable and so on. And this is you know, happening as we speak. I don't have to persuade you, but it transforms completely how science is being done. Okay. Now, if you look back in history, um, the first scientific revolution in terms of process Okay, not, not in the term, in terms of Tom and Thomas Kuhn's uh, paradigm shifts, but in terms of process of doing science. The first revolution was, you know, mid 17th century and was an effect of the invention of the printing press. Okay, because, you know, it's hard to do peer review on journals if you don't have a printing press. Okay, but I'll turn around the argument. The fact that there were printing presses sort of created a different way of doing science and around the time of Newton and the Royal Society, all of a sudden, what before was what I call alchemy became chemistry, because you couldn't just pretend something, you would actually have to document, there would be peer review, the thing would be published, other people could actually reduce the experiment, and that's a total revolution in the way of doing science, okay? And so I would expect, you know, the web was uh, invented about 28 years ago, a quarter century, I would expect there would be a scientific revolution in terms of process due to the World Wide Web. To some extent, it is happening, but it's happening much slower than in other areas of society, right? If you look at, you know, people around you, uh, the World Wide Web has totally changed practically every activity of humankind. The one that has changed very slowly, unfortunately, is science. The reason is a good reason. Scientists tend to be conservative people. That is good, right? You don't jump on the latest fad. You know, you drop everything you do and work on something different. You sort of, you know, you think about things very deeply and so on. But on this one, I think we are a little bit too conservative. Of course, this has also to do with economic incentives. 
You know, the open access debate is essentially a debate between for-profit publication paid for by the taxpayer and by the scientist who spends the time doing peer review and editing the journals and so on. And, you know, companies have found a very interesting business model, um, which is what it is, and this will, you know, uh, have to change. Good. All right. So, in terms of scientific method, uh, you also know that uh, over the course of the last two, three thousand years, we went from a purely theoretical approach to science, sort of philosophical approach, like, you know, Euclid's geometry, to an empirical way of doing science, back to the 17th century or earlier, to in the 20th century what would be computational science, okay, which is a method of doing computational experiments, to finally something which we could call data-driven science. Now, this is a very um, debated topic, right? Some people say, if you look at uh, machine learning, machine learning is an extremely powerful tool, but the truth is that people do not understand what's happening in the black box. Now, in the history of science, you know, you can do experiments and then you can, you know, derive a theory and then based on the theory you can do predictions and so on. It is a little bit scary to think that science would be driven by black boxes, okay? But right now, this is what is happening, and the big challenge in machine learning is uh, what is called understandable machine learning, which would be you run the black box, and then you open the black box, and you try to derive general principles why this particular algorithm for machine learning found this particular trend in the data set uh, that was fed into the black box. But, okay, now, the potential for developments is, you know, as large as you can dream of, but Switzerland is not necessarily ahead of the curve. This has to do with something that was analyzed here by an interest group on ICT. They sort of looked at uh, technology readiness in various forms of ICT in Switzerland, and you can recognize a typical Swiss thing, which is we have enough money to buy the know-how if we are unable to generate it ourselves. I don't think this is a very good situation to be in, but that's a personal comment. Because if you look at the particular case of research and innovation, the readiness seemingly is below 40%, which is not very good when it comes to you know, banking software. I guess it is there and it is running because for the reasons I explained. Okay. And so I think there is room for improvement in making Switzerland as a society and as a hub of international research much more fit in terms of, in particular, data science, but in general, in terms of open science. Okay, good. Now, big data, so people think big data is something that just happened yesterday, okay? And uh, this is absolutely not the case because people have been collecting data for scientific reasons for you know, hundreds of years, and uh, I need to have the proper numbers because otherwise this doesn't really make the effect. It should. So here is a piece of a collection, bird eggs from the British Museum, I believe. Now the numbers I find absolutely flabbergasting is that the Natural History Museum in Paris has 68 million specimens, okay? Little birds, fishes, uh, you name it, okay? And the uh, Natural History Museum in London has even more, 80 million specimens, of which 3.5 million have already been digitized. Now you might think, ah, oh, this is nothing compared to the internet, but if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia has 5.5 million articles, okay? So in some sense, Wikipedia is not there yet, okay? If, you know, the local museum in London has sort of an order of magnitude more objects, okay? And as many... Uh, already digitized as we have Wikipedia articles. Good. Now, you know, the form in which these things are stored is not necessarily absolutely user-friendly for the large masses, right? So I, I'm not sure, is that, is that a bird, look? Or what is it, or an insect or something? And then I think everybody is like, you know, when you comment on a Wikipedia page here, you put a little notice, right? You look at the insect, you say, oh, no, actually, the previous guy didn't really recognize what it was and so on and so on or it's stored in you know, various formats. So the potential, of course, is actually the user-friendliness of what we do now. The process itself on describing the specimen and you know, ev evolving the understanding, etc. This has not changed if it's there 
in a drawer or if it's on Wikipedia. Good. Now, universities are also conservative uh, enterprises. Uh, you know, there's this quote here, universities behave like the internet never happened. Okay. So the first thing we did at EPFL this year is uh, we created a position for a chief information officer uh, who is actually a member of the direction. And uh, on campus, people sort of said, what is this? This is because Vetterli is an IT guy that he needs a member of the direction that worries about information technology. To which I answered that we were an enterprise which has a turnover of about a billion francs a year, uh, bon an, mal an, and uh, the only thing we consume are, is information, and the only thing we produce is information. I mean, sometimes the information is ahead of the students that go out into the real world, but you know, we don't produce chocolate chips or something, right? <laughs> it's only about information. And I can tell you there is no real enterprise in the world that has a turnover of a billion based on information that doesn't have a chief information officer. And I think you know, <laughs> universities should have chief information officers. And you know, I'm glad, very happy, that we actually have one. Good. Let me come to the second part here of the talk, which is the challenges. So you know, that was a nice theory and the little anecdotes. Uh, but this is you know, the transformative power of doing open science, you know, of course, when the rubber hits the road, you know, there is some resistance. Now, there is no resistance in this room, right? If you are in this room, you're probably interested in the topic and convinced that we call preaching to the choir. Uh, but now, why could we actually do this slide? Or you can oh, actually, I have to acknowledge because he did all the hard work, the heavy lifting. Well, because of course the uh, Saint Jean the Baptist preaching by Raphael is available on Wikipedia in a very high quality reproduction and free of any copyright. Okay, and if you ask me, you know, most things should be like this. If you ask an artist, they might actually disagree because artists make a living out of copyright. And if in the, you know, in the abstract it sounds nice that everything is immediately available for free, uh, you probably know that the music industry is going through difficult times. Uh, you know, the media industry is going through difficult times and so on. Even though in the end I think this is the right path, in the transition, these transitions can be very difficult for the people involved, okay, which we should not forget. Now, <laughs> There is an example that we like a lot, which is uh, this debate about open science where some people were reusing data to derive new results. And there was a relatively hot debate that uh, some people accused them of being parasites. Okay? Because you know, it used to be that the most difficult thing to do, let's say in biology, you know, the people doing uh, whatever, collecting ants in Papua New Guinea. So collecting the ant is really the act, you know, the scientific act. But if you think about it, you know, maybe there is more to that business than collecting the ant. Anyway, so if somebody later, you know, takes the ant and finds something new, you know, that's just fine. And so after this debate sort of calmed down, uh, there was this parasite award that was introduced, which actually rewards people who have derived the most interesting new findings based on data that was already available, used for an earlier publication. This I find extremely interesting because if you think about the process of science, I shouldn't say this publicly, but the process of science is not very efficient. But that's you know, fundamental to science. I'm a great believer in serendipity. You cannot you know, say what you are going to do and what you're going to find. If that's the case, then it's not science. Still, in this process, I think there are many, many places where we can be more efficient. OK. And there are places where I think we have no choice. This is a very recent example. It's uh, the, the genome analysis of the, uh, of the Zika vir virus. You know that during the Ebola crisis, there was, the Ebola crisis was called humongous, but there was also a crisis of data. Uh, because the people who were, the scientists who were working on trying to find a vaccine were trying to publish papers so the data was actually stuck uh, behind not just paywalls but it was stuck in peer review for almost a year until the data was available to the larger community. Meanwhile people were dying 
And uh, I think that was a wake-up call to that particular science community that uh, if you had real medical emergencies, I think in general that should be the case, data, of course, has to be uh, put online immediately. In Switzerland, I think we have a number of pioneers. So the open data movement here in Switzerland is a very nice one. But earlier initiatives around, uh, around protein sequencing and, and structures uh, I think it was mostly led by University of Geneva initially, but now it's a, a big project of the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics. These are very nice examples of open data and the impact it has on the process of science. Let me skip the Dilbert cartoon because it's really too long for uh, the late hour we are at. Okay. Um, but, okay, let me give the gist of the Dilbert cartoon. It's prisoner's <laughs> dilemma. Okay. Why Prisoner's Dilemma? You know the game theoretic setup of Prisoner's Dilemma. It's about me as a scientist. You know, do I share the data? And then maybe the reward for me as a scientist based on my data is going to be diminished because I have to share it with somebody else. Or we can collaborate sharing the data and we're all go going to gain from it. Now, in different cases, you know, it's not clear what the solution You know that the, the, the prisoner's dilemma is actually a paradox in, in game series. There is no uh, single answer to it because rational people can take one or the other decision. And the collective benefit is actually unclear. But most of the time, people actually will maximize their own benefit. And so the community is actually not gaining. Okay? So I think the community, which means universities, funding agencies, and so on, has to put incentives in place so as to break this prisoner's dilemma paradox. OK. All right. So um, what is also interesting is that scientists are sort of waking up to some of these things. Here, OK, we don't have a pointer, so I'm going to go hand wave my way through this. So you know, in various surveys, recent surveys about open data, you know, you get all sorts of answers, right? People think, yeah, it's sort of cool, uh, and it would be good if my data would be cited, so I get you know hits on, on Google Scholar for the data. That would be good. Uh, but actually, people don't really know how to cite data. It's a typical thing, right? You know, please cite my data, even though I don't know how to cite your data. Um, or you know, uh, two thirds of the scientists think they own the data they generate. Okay. Now, if they think they own it, it's unclear they are going to share it as freely as we would like it to be. Which means we are in a sort of a transition period where open data is happening, but it's a new thing, and so people sort of start to figure out how to deal with it. I also think it's a generational thing. I think the dinosaurs, like me, come from another generation, the young people like my colleague Marcel Sarate are you know, totally into this movement. I think you know, our PhD students are totally in this movement. So as Max Planck said, uh, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> OK. So OK. Um, good, after this quiet moment. Uh, so <laughs> there is a very interesting report, actually dates from, I think, four or five years ago by the Royal Society, we are very British-centric today, uh, about uh, open science. It's a, it's a, there is a long version, but even the short version, which is the resume, is actually very, a very valuable document to read. What I find interesting, they call this a stairway to data heaven, is that we are sort of you know, at the very low steps here, uh, where we say, ah, we should be open and so on. But what we really have to do is, of course, get to the top. And I'll go straight to the top. The top is not to put data online. The top is to actually do something with the online data. And this, of course, will require working on data science, on machine learning, on data mining, having the slew of specialists that can actually uh, do something with the data. You know the uh, expression, data is a new oil. Unless it's refined, it's useless. All right. Good. Um, now, if you look at open data, you can also verify something that is classic in computer science, which is rubbish in, rubbish out. So data has a cycle, which is described here on this slide. And this cycle says uh, it's essentially about curation. 
and going through life cycle management of the data, you know, maybe coming back to the same set later with some new insights and so on. And um, I think, you know, the summary is that from data publication, we have to come to data quality, which is an interesting topic for um, not just scientists, per, but for professionals of curation. And professionals of curation historically are people that work in libraries, okay? So in the old days, there was no internet, right? So the curation of the know-how of the scientific literature, you know, you would go to the library and there would be a specialist. And he or she would uh, sort of lead you to the sources of information. In some sense, this role has been taken over by Google, okay, and other search engines. Uh, but the role of uh, the library is the one that they should be involved in the curation of the data that is generated by the researchers on their respective campus. So for example, at EPFL, uh, the library services are very involved in our initiative on open data. All right, let me move on here and also mention that at the end of the day, if things are not easy to do, they don't get, you know, they don't get done. The example here is very simple. It's uh, the publication of papers and which promised to put the data online. And um, of course, and the people sort of submit the, pa the paper, they wait on the peer review result, and then the paper gets published, and the people actually forget to put the data online because you know, we are busy and disorganized and you know, running around. And so somebody actually wrote a bot which verifies that the data in, pub in open publications is online. If not, they actually tell people Please wake up and do what you promised. And you can see here is a number of data sets which are overdue. So the paper was published. The data set, even though it was promised, has not been put online. And when this bot was uh, introduced, it's called wide open, you see that immediately uh, very, very few data sets were outstanding. And this also points to, I think, you know, the nitty gritty details of the IT infrastructure you want for open science. So from the theory to actually doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there is a lot of, you know, the devil is in the detail, and the more the communities together work in making this automatic, the better the quality of the open science will be. Okay, so let me simply finish with what we try to do at EPFL today, these days, and uh, it's relatively simple, and it's uh, an old mantra, we like this quote uh, by a very famous guy, John Stuart Mill, um, who said, a university exists for the purpose of laying open to each succeeding generation the accumulated treasures of the thoughts of mankind. Beautifully said, and this is why universities are here, and that's why universities are not companies, not for-profit operations, but they are sort of the curators of the pillars of knowledge on the one hand, and the generators of new knowledge. And from that point of view, it's a no-brainer that, of course, universities should be totally open. And it's sort of a, a paradox that uh, this is not more widespread. You know, sometimes people along the way forgot why they were actually doing the business they are doing, which is creating new knowledge for the good of humanity. Now, at EPFL, we have three missions, like uh, you know, any institute of technology, so education, research, and tech transfer. And uh, within these missions, we are very concerned about the digitalization, I would say. And um, this is, you know, it's not just uh, because it's uh, trendy, because I think it is transformational for the way the university works. So here I just list a few things that have happened at EPFL for those of you who are not too familiar with the school. So, uh, you know, it had an early computer science department, even though in Europe we have been, you know, 10 or 20 years late with respect to the US, which we are still paying in some sense. You know, the dividend of the US being ahead is that all major IT companies dealing with data science are essentially US owned. And that's, you know, uh, I, I would say that's really the tribute we pay from in the 60s and 70s, Europe not being really engaged in computer science research at, uh, you know, at an international level. But anyway, that's water under the bridge, so we're trying to catch up. 
So we had a number of uh, initiatives. I think the one that is interesting is this massive open online courses, which if you think about it, it's the open science version for education. And it's something that was debated at the time. And uh, EPFL simply said, well, we don't know the answer. Let's just try. Okay? And I must say, this was a very, very interesting experiment. It's also one that is not easy to run. And um, as you can guess, some people you know, sort of criticized EPFL by saying, OK, here is this public school funded by public money. And they invest resources to teach the rest of the world. Okay? Now first, my argument is that this is a Swiss historical tradition. So Pestalozzi, uh, who is one of my uh, heroes, you know, invented essentially free public schooling for Switzerland in the 19th century. There is an interesting number when he started, I think that less than a third of the population knew how to read and write. I think it was in the 20s, low 20s percent. And when he passed away four years later, I think 70% of the population in Switzerland had had access to free public education and knew how to read and write. Now, why is this fundamental? Because unless this had been done by Pestalozzi and his followers, Switzerland would not have been ready for the first industrial revolution. And Switzerland would be certainly not the country we know today and that we can enjoy all the riches that have followed from Switzerland being at the forefront in that case of education. In some sense, what I feel is that we are probably at a similar cusp with digitalization, with uh, computer science being, you know, computer science and its effect of society being transformational. And if Switzerland is not at the forefront, we could actually miss the boat, right? We could miss the fourth industrial revolution. We could have people that are not ready for these transformations. That could be bad news for Switzerland. That's what I'm trying to explain, as you can guess. OK, so that was the historical tradition of Pestalozzi. So I come back to the, the initial argument about MOOCs. Uh, so by putting courses online, what happens is that you get a lot of data about learners which you don't get in a, you know, you look at a room like this, you know, you're a captive audience, you sit there for an hour, you like it or not, it's sort of difficult to wiggle out, right? And, you know, at the end, I get some feedback, you know, if you were totally bored or if this was, you know, uh, was okay. And that's what happens when we teach in a classroom setting. If you teach online, um, I have this example, which we gave this, uh, not, you know, rather mathematical course. So if we would explain you know, Fourier series, and the first thing we would do is put you know, an integral and an infinite summation or whatever, we would essentially instantly see you know, half of the people drop the class. Right? <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. You can see this from one lecture to the next. You can see sort of, you know, people drop out anyway, right? It's free, so you, know, you, you get what you pay for. So you see the drop, and then you would do something silly, like going to the blackboard and writing a very abstruse equation half of the people would leave the class, okay? And so, but you know, this comes with a lot of, you know, feedback from clicks, from how they watch the videos, how they do on quiz, etc. So actually the effect of us teaching this online, and that was a course where we had taught the course for 10 years, we really thought we knew where, what we were doing, okay? So much for knowing what we are doing. Uh, we had written the textbook and so on. Well, based on the feedback we got from the online class, we completely transformed the, the course we are giving on campus. Okay? And why did this happen? Because we had access to data, which we don't really get. When you teach on campus, you get one measurement point, which is the final exam at the end of the semester. And you know, you taught you know, Fourier series, you put an exam question, and you discover, well, sorry, I didn't do it the right way. Good. Now, more to the topic of open science. Um, we are currently launching this fall a master in data science. And this is a result from the ETH domain uh, creating uh, the Swiss Data Science Center, which is a, uh, an effort between ETH Zurich and us. And, um, and this has a lot of effects. This master in data science, which looks like it's going to be very popular, has also an effect on the entire campus because lots of people from other fields you know, would like to learn about data science. Okay, let me skip the MOOCs here. Let me make one more point about teaching because I'm very interested actually in teaching issues. Um, when we looked at the curriculum at EPFL, which is an institute of technology, so we have scientists and engineers and architects, 
Uh, the pillars of the educational system at EPFL is mathematics and physics, okay? Uh, you know, like in other institutes of technology. So, uh, and I still believe these are pillars of, you know, of the business we are in. Mathematics sort of is a way to think problems very clearly, to know when you know, in some sense. It's like epistemology. And uh, physics, of course, is modeling the complex world by making models and verifying how close or far away you are from the real world. Now, most scientists and engineers, in their day-to-day -day, uh, job, which can be research or R&D, actually use a computer to find answers to the questions. Okay? So they do actually something different than what we teach them. We teach them math, right? Here is a theorem, here is how you prove the theorem. We teach them physics, you know, here is thermodynamics or phase transitions. But what they do, okay, they have a question, let's say in chemistry, they go to a computer and they try to find the answer to the question. Now the question they are trying to answer may not have an answer, or it might have several answers, or it might have an answer, but the algorithm to find the answer is so complex that they will never get to the answer, okay? And this fundamental way of thinking of problems, we call this computational thinking, we sort of don't really teach this. So we are going to introduce this as a third pillar of education at EPFL starting in the fall of 2018. I have a little example, but I'm going to skip it, about NP complete problems. Uh, that, that will be for the apero, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay. Something else that happened on, on a campus like EPFL is that we moved from the instrumentation on the left Again, back to Newton, to the instrumentation on the right. But the way to document how we do our research, and I'm a case in point, right? I run around with a moleskin and write little things, okay? It hasn't changed in uh, 300 and plus years. Um, so one initiative at EPFL, and there are other campuses also are active in this, is an electronic lab book. And the electronic lab book, of course, is a much better way to do documentation, it allows very easily from the lab book to generate uh, you know, data for papers, to generate data for you know, keeping trace of what's happening and so on. And uh, the electronic lab book is uh, you know, one of the initiatives of providing pl IT platforms to make the uh, process of doing science more efficient. Okay, so speaking of efficient science, I mentioned before that uh, this Parasite Award, and I think this is something we're going to see more and more, is that people take failed experiments from somebody else, or many failed experiments, plus a few successful experiments, and will essentially apply machine learning and data mining to find new results. Now, this is like, you know, finding gold out of dirt, because people sort of, you know, left negative results in the drawer, which is another problem, right? Negative results are just as important as positive results, but the incentive system in academia unfortunately doesn't recognize this. But I'm hoping that with the generalization of data mining to many fields of science, actually, also the negative results will be put in databases so other people can actually do the data mining. Okay, as I mentioned, we have this big Swiss Data Science Center initiative which has taken off very well. It was started uh, earlier this February, and it's already humming. It had called for proposals for scientists coming with their data, and the Swiss Data Science Center has specialists to help scientists from you know, very different sciences to actually uh, find results. And uh, I think this will be a service for the Swiss academic community, which will be very valuable. Uh, beyond data, you know that uh, beyond open access and open data, when it comes to hardware, there are lots of initiatives on doing open hardware. This is, for example, an example from EPFL, from Francesco Mondada, who is a roboticist, who uh, publishes open source all the designs for the robots he is making. This has potentially a large effect because you know, then the robots can be manufactured anywhere and potentially also at you know, more affordable uh, prices than what would happen in uh, Switzerland. Now, a question I always get, and so finally we put the slide, is how can you do open science and work with industry or have startups come out of your lab? 
And so there the tension is a very simple tension uh, between what we call authorship and ownership. So ownership is typically done through patents. And the method is uh, relatively simple, is that if um, you're on a research topic where you intend to have a startup company, uh, then you probably should think about this. You're not going to put everything online first and then say, oh, and now I need to raise venture capital to run a company. That's not going to work. You have to be aware that, of course, if things have been published, you cannot patent them. But this is not at all a real problem. I mean, as long as you manage this process carefully, uh, you know, you put some, uh, some wait time between when you file a patent until you publish uh, the results. This, I would say, in fundamental research is not so important. In applied research, where you have, let's say, PhD students or postdocs who are interested in industrial transfer, you have to be a little bit careful about this. Okay, I think I've taken enough of your time, and so let me come to conclusions here, and I'll just put the picture, which is a reference to Magritte, so Sassine Pan, you are. So, of course, everything will end up in the cloud. Um, that we know, I think we should be a little bit careful that we don't become totally dependent on cloud providers. I think, uh, as you know, most cloud providers are very nice companies that have a business model but are uh, situated in a country that is run by a new president. And, um, <laughs> which, I mean, this is only half a joke, right? Uh, I mean, there is a, a certain degree of arbitrariness that is happening there which could be worrisome, uh, you know. I mean, the case of climate research is the one that is well known, where you know, people have said maybe we should actually move climate data out of the United States, for example, back to Europe, because it's unclear that the data is actually safe in a US environment. I think it's an extreme example, but climate research is about extreme uh, effects. Um, but I think it's a more general <coughs> question where Europe and Switzerland, as a small part of Europe, has to be aware that unless we master the tools, we are going to be dependent on forces we don't master. And usually I tell this in the story of, um, of Gandhi. Uh, when Gandhi was fighting for the independence of India, he noticed that the cotton was produced in India, and then it was sent to uh, Great Britain, where in Great Britain they would actually you know, make clothes out of it, uh, shirts and so on, and they would sell back the, the shirts to India, of course with you know, a multiplication by two orders of magnitude of the price of the, uh, of the cotton. Okay? And so Gandhi said, this is impossible. We have, to do, we have to make our own shirts. And there was a whole movement where Gandhi uh, you know, uh, persuaded people to actually uh, do the job in India so the cotton would not do these little detours through England and have an overpriced by a factor of 100. I think in the data domain, we are essentially in the same situation because we produce the data, right? Let's say on mobility and science and so on. And then the data gets shipped somewhere else and it comes back with a slight price tag, okay? And we have little control over this. I think it is a, what I call a, a digital colon, colonization of Europe. And uh, I think the answer is not necessarily to give fines to Google. You, you maybe read today that Google got a fine of 2.3 um, billion, 2.3 billion dollars which is pocket money for a company like Google. I mean, it's not nothing, but it's not, you know, it's not going to create a cr uh, trouble to, to Google. I think the answer of Europe and the answer of Switzerland is simply to be as innovative as uh, these US companies to be able to compete at, uh, you know, at a similar level. Okay, on this rather philosophical note, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for that large grosser Borgen that you, that you just drew. That's uh, fascinating. Um, and we can't let you go without some questions. So please, if anybody um, up there, yes, please. Do you need a microphone? I should. No, I, hopefully not. Um, can you understand me? 
All right. Um, thank you very much. That was really, really fascinating. Uh, one point you made very early on at, at the end of your of your remarks was about uh, publishing research data uh, as an integral part of the scientific process, something that I believe is, is uh, very, very important. Yet what I wanted to ask you as, as somebody uh, who's probably written hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of grant proposals and uh, getting money from third uh, parties, how often are you actually able to include the costs of open data publishing in a grant proposal. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to have an, uh, an open access budget line because that's pretty common these days. But how about an open data budget line in uh, research proposals that you are writing at the EPFL? That's a, that is a very, very good question. Yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we are going through the same process as with open access to publication. Mm -hmm. At first, you know, the granting agencies sort of ignored this because they were whatever. Uh, and then you could put them on the grants. And then I can tell you that the granting agencies, we saw this firsthand, sort of underestimated how expensive it would be, OK? Uh, but OK, they, they, you know, because this publication process is actually extremely inefficient, OK? But that's another discussion. And I think we're going to go through the same motions with open data. I think personally, uh, the answer is going to be that universities or places where people do the research have to get ready for this, right? I mean, I, you know, it's like natural that you know, if I can buy lab equipment and run my lab and pay you know, for whatever, the heating bill, I should be able to have an infrastructure either at my university or collectively for Switzerland, which will make open data you know, an easy step and not a prohibitively expensive step. I think uh, granting agencies are going to allow you, know, uh, you to, to, to build for open data. Uh, the, you know, the most forward-looking ones like the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, are really on this, uh, are going in this direction. I think they already have done it. And I would expect the National Science Foundation to do the same. But it's an important point. We have one more question. I'd like to make a comment on that previous discussion and then ask a question, if, if I may. Yep. Um, the issue of being able to pay data deposit fees, for example, from research grants or to top slice part of the research grant for, to pay for data infrastructure, that is already happening in some countries. Um, I was <coughs> excuse me, co-chair of an OECD Global Science Forum report which will be released towards the end of this year, and in that we surveyed the business models and the funding sources <laughs> of nearly 50 data repositories. And there are a handful which are beginning to finance themselves essentially through data deposit fees. The Archaeology Data Service um, in the UK is one, the Dryer Data Repository is another, and granting agencies are beginning to allow this um, in a number of countries. So, and I think that is likely to be one, but not the only significant ways in which we fund data infrastructure into the future. Um, my, my question was that you mentioned very clearly, and I applauded, that the next challenge is not just open data, but the quality of data. But you didn't mention the criteria about that. You had the, the steps from the Royal Society report. Um, you didn't mention fair data or the other criteria or attributes of data that are circulated in policy documents or guidance on data. So I wondered whether you had any comments on fair data, that acronym, and, and what you think the next steps to achieve quality of data and reusability of data is. Okay, so let me, thank you for the first comment, which is very much to the point. Let me simply say that when we talk about storing data, we also have to be uh, a little bit careful how much we are going to store, right? And uh, I, I always like to take the examples of the people who invented the World Wide Web, which is a CERN, when uh, they were hunting for the Higgs boson uh, at the end, you know, they were looking for a five sigma statistical test of the presence or absence of the Higgs boson. Um, but meanwhile, at the detectors on the LHC, at the detector, I think they are throwing away 99% of the measurements at the detector. So, you know, if we would ask the CERN to actually store all the primary data, you know, they would explode, right? There is no way to do this. And there are many fields of science where there is no way to store all of the data. You know, MRI scans, uh, uh, studies over time of, you know, phenomena and so on in fluid dynamics or whatever, right? And which is a little bit a, a segue into the answer to the second question, which I think data will have exactly the same as papers. 
I mean, there are good papers and there are bad papers, okay? And the good papers get citations and the bad ones don't. And data will go through the same motions where at some point people will recognize what is a very high quality data set and what is noise. But this will take time for the communities to figure this one out, right? Uh, and it will not be an easy process, but it will naturally follow when the data is online, essentially you'll have a page rank uh, that will be influenced by the quality of the data. But it's a learning process and each community will have to go through this learning process. I think some already know this, the physicists, for example. I mean, you, there was a, the LIGO debate just recently about uh, gravitational waves. You could see the physicists very quickly, you know, you know to, to distinguish, uh, you know, the data from the noise. Some other communities will have to learn the hard way, uh, but that's the only way forward.